Have you ever asked yourself of your purpose in this life? Is there really a life after death? If so, could there really be heaven and hell? What if I'm not ready to die yet? Where will my soul go? Our discussion for today is very interesting. Let's talk about the Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri. Who is Dante Alighieri, the poet? He was born in 1265 and died in 1321. He is an Italian poet, prose writer, literary theorist, moral philosopher, and political thinker. He is best known for the monumental epic poem La Commedia, later named La Divina Commedia, now in English, The Divine Comedy. This epic poem of Italy was a landmark in Italian literature and among the greatest works of all medieval European literature. It is considered a profound Christian vision of humankind's temporal and eternal destiny. Do you know that he wrote this epic poem in the last 13 years of his life? Yes, on its own most personal level, it draws on Dante's experience of exile from his native city of Florence. The reason for his exile? Dante was accused of corruption and financial wrongdoing by the Black Guelphs for the time that Dante was serving as city prior. That's Florence's highest position then. That was for two months in 1300. So most likely during these times he was able to question himself, reassess himself, ask about his purpose in life. What happens when he dies? Is there a life after death? When he was writing the poem, The Divine Comedy, he was alone. As Dante, the character in The Divine Comedy, his alter ego, is alone in the poem, trying to get his head around everything that has happened that this Dante here, the character, traveled, wandering in the middle of nowhere, in the dark wood, in the forest, uh, traveling as a pilgrim, that he needs to pass through the Inferno, Purgatorio, and later on, Paradiso. And so the Divine Comedy is widely considered the preeminent work of Italian literature. It is seen as one of the greatest works of world literature. The poem's imaginative and allegorical vision of the afterlife is a culmination of the medieval world view as it had developed in the Western Church. Allegorical, in short, is symbolic. So that means to say, as we read the poem of the Divine Comedy, you have to take you don't have to take it literally. Everything is symbolic. You have to dig deep. So it is divided into three parts, Inferno, Purgatorio, Paradiso. The primary theme of this poem is clear, the state of souls after death. So Dante here, the author, hoped to lead all his readers to a greater understanding of his place in the universe and to prepare him for the next life, for the life that begins after death. And the great impact of this literary piece is on its readers, making the readers ask themselves, what is the purpose of this life? Is there a life after death? If so, how should we prepare for it? Why, in short, are we here? Inferno's the first part of this narrative poem. Inferno opens on the evening of Good Friday in the year 1300. Traveling through a dark wood, Dante has lost his path and now wanders fearfully through the forest. The sun shines down on the mountain above him and he attempts to climb up to it but finds his way blocked by three beasts, a leopard, a lion, and a she-wolf. Frightened and helpless, Dante returns to the dark wood. There, he encounters the ghost of Virgil, the great Roman poet, 
who has come to guide Dante back to his path to the top of the mountain. Virgil says that their path will take them through the hell and that they will eventually reach heaven where Dante's beloved Beatrice awaits. He adds that it was Beatrice, along with two other holy women, who, seeing Dante lost in the wood, sent Virgil to guide him. You can run, but you can't hide. You can run, but you cannot hide. You can run, but you cannot hide. You can run, but you cannot hide. <laughs> The ferryman Charon then takes him and his guide Virgil across the river of Acheron, the real border of hell. The first circle of hell, Limbo, houses pagans including Virgil and many of the other great writers and poets of antiquity who died without knowing Christ. And they reside there in the Limbo in extreme loneliness. Dante continues into the second circle of hell, served for the sin of lust. At the border of the second circle, the monster Minus lurks, assigning condemned souls to their punishments. He curls his tail around himself a certain number of times, indicating the number of the circle to which the soul must go. Inside the second circle, Dante watches as the souls of the lustful swirl about in a terrible, terrible storm, Dante meets Francesca, who tells him the story of her doomed love affair with Paolo de Rimini, her husband's brother. Their relationship has landed both in hell. In the third circle of hell, the gluttonous must lie in mud and endure the reign of filth and excrement. Dante encounters ordinary people here, not characters from epic poems or gods from mythology. Aside from being constantly bitten and pelted by the rain and hail, the souls jammed to the third circle of hell are also tormented by Cerberus. Dante borrowed this three-headed hellhound along with many of the other guardians he finds in hell from Greek mythology. In Dante's hell, Cerberus rips, rends, and flays the souls around him with his teeth and claws. In the fourth circle, the avaricious and the prodigal are made to charge at one another with giant boulders. Dante encounters more ordinary people but also the guardian of the circle, Pluto, the mythological king of the underworld. This circle is served for people who hoarded or squandered their money, but Dante and Virgil do not directly interact with any of its inhabitants. This is the first time they pass through a circle without speaking to anyone, a commentary on Dante's opinion of greed as a higher sin. The fifth circle of hell contains the river Styx, a swampy, fetid cesspool in which the wrathful spend eternity struggling with one another. The sullen lie bound beneath the Styx waters, choking on the mud. Dante glimpses Flippo Argenti, a former political enemy of his, and watches in the light as other souls tear the man to pieces.
In this circle, Dante and Virgil are threatened by the Furies when they try to enter through the walls of this. This is a further progression in Dante's evaluation of the nature of sin. He also begins to question himself in his own life, realizing his actions in nature could lead him to his permanent torture. From nowhere, an angelic messenger arrives from heaven to force the gates open before Dante, now entering the sixth circle. The sixth circle of hell houses the heretics, the sinners of heresy, the rejection of religious and or political norms. Dante encounters here Farinata, a military leader and aristocrat who tried to win the Italian throne and was convicted posthumously of heresy in 1283. Dante also meets Epicurus, Pope Anastasius II, and Emperor Frederick II. The Seventh Circle, The Violence In this circle of hell, there are three sub-circles, namely the outer, the middle, and the inner circle or rings. These circles house different types of violent criminals. Centaurs, creatures who are half man, half horse, guard this first ring, dwelt by sinners who are violent toward others, and they spend eternity in a river of boiling blood. As the guards, centaurs would shoot its inhabitants with arrows, those who are attempting to escape. The middle ring consists of those who commit violence against themselves, the suicides. These souls must endure eternity in the form of trees, others perpetually eaten by harpies. The inner ring is made up of the blasphemers, or those who are violent against God and nature. Here, Dante has met his own mentor, Brunetto Latini, a sodomite, but Dante speaks kindly to him. Sodomites are those who were violent toward nature. These souls were walking on a desert of burning sand. The usurers are also here, as are those who blaspheme not just against God but also the gods such as Capaneos who blasphemed against Zeus. The monster Gerion transports Virgil and Dante across the great abyss to the eighth circle of hell. The eighth circle is known to have malibulge or evil pockets or pouches. The term refers to the circle's division into various pockets separated by great folds of earth. In the first pocket, the panderers and the seducers receive lashings from whips. In the second, the flatterers must lie in a river of human feces. The simoniacs in the third pouch hang upside down in baptismal fonts while their feet burn with fire. The fourth pouch are the astrologists or diviners forced to walk with their heads on backwards, a sight that moves Dante to great pity. In the fifth pouch or pocket, the berators, those who accepted bribes, they steep in pitch while demons tear them apart. The hypocrites in the sixth pouch must forever walk in circles wearing heavy robes made of lead. Saifat, the priest who confirmed Jesus' death sentence, lies crucified on the ground. The other sinners tread on him as they walk. In the horrifying seventh pouch, the thieves sit trapped in a pit of vipers, becoming vipers themselves when bitten. To regain their form, they must bite another thief in turn. In the eighth pouch or pocket of the eighth circle of hell, Dante speaks to Ulysses, the great hero of the Hom Homer's epic, now doomed to an eternity among those guilty of spiritual theft. The false counselors for his role in executing the ruse of the Trojan horse. 
in the ninth pouch or pocket of the souls of sowers of scandal and schism, they walked in a circle, constantly afflicted by wounds that open and close repeatedly. In the tenth pouch, the falsifiers, they suffer from horrible plagues and diseases. Finally, Virgil and Dante proceed to the ninth circle of health through the giant's well, which leads to a massive drop to Cocytus, a great frozen lake. The giant Antaeus picks Virgil and Dante up and sets them down to the bottom of the well, in the lowest region of hell, in Cainum. The first ring of the ninth circle of hell, those who betray their kin, stand frozen up to their necks in the lakes of ice. In Antonora, the second ring, those who betray their country and party stand frozen up to their heads. Here, Dante meets Count Ugolino, who spends eternity gnawing on the head of the man who imprisoned him in life. In Ptolemia, the third ring, those who betray their guests spend eternity lying on their backs in the frozen lake their tears making blocks of ice over their eyes. Dante next follows Virgil into Judeca, the fourth ring of the ninth circle of hell and the lowest depth. Here, those who betray their benefactors spend eternity in complete icy submersion. A huge, mist-shrouded form lurks ahead and Dante approaches it. It is the three-headed giant Lucifer Plunged waist deep into the ice, his body pierces the center of the earth where he fell when God hurled him down from heaven. Each of Lucifer's mouths chose one of history's three greatest sinners, Judas, the betrayer of Christ, and Cassius and Brutus, the betrayers of Julius Caesar. Virgil leads Dante on a climb down Lucifer's massive form, holding onto his frozen tufts, of hair. Eventually, the poet reached the Lethe, the river of forgetfulness, and travel from there out of hell and back unto earth. They emerge from hell on Easter morning, just before sunrise.